You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. This week, a very special show, and I want to give you guys some background on who we're talking to, Justin Watt was a member of the 101st Airborne Division, and at the time, his platoon was stationed in an area called Matmedia or Yusufia, which is about 15 to 20 miles southeast of Baghdad. And back in 2006, an Iraqi family was murdered there in that location in their home. At the time, most people thought it was Iraqi on Iraqi crime, Sunni versus Shia, which were the two main tribal clans that were fighting against each other at the time. And so the initial thought was that It was done by Iraqis, two other Iraqis. We came out later to find that it was four American soldiers who committed the crimes. Those four American soldiers were in the same platoon as our guest Justin Watt. The only reason this was all brought to light is because Justin Watt and another member of his platoon, Sergeant John Deem, who will show up in a later episode of the Hazard Ground podcast, had enough courage to be the whistleblowers in the situation and bring the information to light. So with that, let's welcome him into the Hazard Ground Podcast. It is Justin Watt. Justin, thank you so much for being here, man. Oh, thank you for having me. I, I genuinely appreciate it. All right. Well, we always start the podcast off with asking everybody the same question, which is, why did you join the military? How'd you get started? Um, kind of a funny story, actually. Um, so I had a, I, originally I was misguided, uh, and I was going to join the Navy and do the SEAL Challenge. Um, but my buddy ended up bailing out on me at the last minute. Um, and so like that got put on hold for a few years and I, uh, ended up working at a casino for a while. Um, ultimately, uh, I had joined the, uh, through the debt process cause I was like 17 when I was going through it with the Navy and my original ship date, as it turns out was like nine 11, 2001, like the proposed ship date, uh, before he bailed on me and then my job wasn't available. So I ended up getting out of that, the, the whole situation, but a couple of years later after nine 11 happened, um, I found that debt ID. Um, and it was just like, I just kind of felt like someone was taking my place. And, uh, I was just like, you know, I've got to do something about this. And the situation was right. And, um, you know, 12 days later I was in the infantry. So that's, uh, that's pretty much how it worked out. If nine 11 didn't happen, do you think you would have still joined? Do you think you would have made that decision? I always, I always, uh, you know, I mean, my, my dad was a soldier. Um, and, and, you know, he was in the army. I, uh, I always had like great admiration for it. I was always curious about it, but, um, you know, I, I, I don't really know. I mean, I think that it, it's a combination of a lot of things for a lot of people. Like, you know, not only do you have to have the drive to do it, but the circumstances kind of have to be right where, you know, you're at a point in your life where you can make that type of a commitment. So, um, I, I would like to say, yeah, but, um, the truth of the matter is, I mean, I think that that was such a strong and compelling event that, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I can't really imagine otherwise, if that makes sense. Now, did you just go for the infantry because you wanted to be in the mix? Look, there were bad guys who did stuff to us and you wanted to get them back. What was the reason for the infantry? Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I mean, I, when I took the ASVAB, I, I scored high enough to pretty much do whatever I wanted. Um, and like at that time, like nobody wanted to be in the infantry. Right, I got like yeah. a $20,000 bonus, uh, when I joined, um, which was crazy. Um, but, yeah, no, it was. Uh, I had just watched. Oh man, I'm like the the world's biggest cliche, right? Like I just watched uh, Band of Brothers, uh, <laughs> and it was like, I mean, because I, I you were feeling it, man. I scored high enough. Yeah, I, I joined high enough, and or I mean, I, I scored high enough. Um, and when I joined, they needed people so badly. It's like if you had a good score, then you could pretty much you know ask for whatever you wanted. And I was like, I want infantry, I want 101st Airborne Guaranteed Unit, and. Uh, and that's it. If you can't do it for me, I'm not, I'm not joining. And, uh, they're like, Oh, well, we're, we're going to make it happen. So, you know, 12 days later I was, I was, uh, down in Fort Benning having the, the time of my life. Yeah. Well, sure. listen, you, you, you made a recruiter's dream come true when they hear stuff like that scored high enough. Yeah, we'll get it done, man. Hey, listen, that's a, that's, that's, that, that's a, a session for me and I'll take the points, everything else. But yeah, so you get back down to Fort Benning. Okay. This is always great. Cause I love to get people's view of the whole thing. Did you know what to expect going into Fort Benning? Oh God, no! I mean, I, were you I, shocked? Like, oh God, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I being honest with you, I mean, and that's yeah. So it's like yeah, to answer your first question again a little bit better too. It's like yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to do something where it was like you know I was on the ground, experiencing everything and, and 
the guy who actually does the work. And, you know, like if there's bad guys, I wanted to fight the bad guys. If there's, you know, food to give out or medical supplies to give out, I wanted to do that. So, I mean, I wanted to be on the ground um, and, and just be a part of, you know, what was really happening kind of on the front lines. But um, in regards to my expectations, it's like, I mean, I was, I don't I want to say I was like 22, 23 when I joined. So, like, a little bit older, I was out of shape. I mean, most of the guys that joined the infantry, it's like they're like these little high school kids that are like fresh out of football, you know. And so, like, punishments, like, like push-ups don't really mean anything to them, you know. <laughs> and mm-hmm. it's like, to me, it was like, oh, my God, just do it right so we could stop getting smoked. You know, it was, it was extremely painful. It was like total culture shock. Um, like, base training was actually pretty difficult for me, but... Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was a good experience. You know, I was I was definitely, uh, you know, shocked at at uh, just kind of like the difference. Like you learn to appreciate so much. Like, I mean, even there's so many things you take for granted, like being able to use the phone when you want, being able to listen to yep. music when you want, yep. uh, what music you get to listen to. You know, I mean, you know, it was uh, you definitely realize how how uh, how good you've got it back home for sure when you join the infantry, but. Um, yeah, no, it was a good experience. At any point, were you regretting your decision to go infantry? Every every time I was in the front leaning rest, for sure. I would, I would have, if you would have, if they would have had a piece of paper that I could sign, they'd be like give back the twenty thousand dollar bonus and just send me home. You know what I mean? Like I would have signed that thing like five hundred times. That's um, a, that's I'm, awesome. I'm just kidding, but no, I mean I I really I really wanted to to finish. I mean, there's you know. I mean, certainly you're just like, oh, my God, what did I get myself into? But never, never wanted to quit. Uh, listen, you're not alone. There's a lot of us who put on a uniform at some point in time and go, maybe this wasn't the best idea. I, I, I like Just a quick little anecdote, funny story. I remember as a lieutenant, I walked into a company meeting, and it was like they called it at 5.30 a.m., and I was just tired from the night before and grumpy and angry, and I walked in. You know those little green books that everybody carries around in the military? Yeah, it's like this little yeah. green. It's this very notable color green that everybody read. I walked in, slammed the book down, and one of the sergeants said, what's the problem, sir? I said, I should have taken out a damn loan, you know, because I went on RTC, yeah. so I was like, you know. <laughs> yep. We, we all you have know? those moments. It's very, very real. Okay, uh, tell oh, me, absolutely. Tell me about basic because that's where a lot of bonds are made between guys. Like you, you end up making friends for life yeah. there. Did you did you meet anybody? Is you still in contact with those guys? Um, you know what? No, not really. Um, really, kind of interesting scenario there. There was a. Uh, I mean, I had you know I made really good friends when I was there, but like everyone, like because I was I had requested the hundred and first, I was like the only guy from my base training class I was going to 101st. Like, and that was just because I had it in my contract. Everyone else was in my class, um, down at Charlie 258, was uh, headed off to Alaska or Germany. Oh, wow. Um, I think those were, the two, those were the two units that were getting plussed up uh, with guys coming out of my class once the orders came down. So, you know, it was just kind of like we, we lost touch. But, I mean, I had a, a few good friends. I mean, my drill sergeant, I, I mean, I still remember that. I mean, the drill sergeant Walls and drill sergeant Asbury, I actually tried to look them up because I, I remember, uh, like, finally, uh, it was like we had just finished, like, the FTX, and, uh, like, we were going up to, to Honor Hill, and, um, I mean, I was, like, so exhausted and dehydrated from, like, being in the field and, like, doing that. Like, I, I want to say it was uh, uh, either, like, a 25-miler or a 30-miler to finish it up back then. What's Honor Hill? But, um, uh, uh, Honor Hill is, like, it's, it's where you go and you get your cross rifles, like, every... every okay, event. gotcha. Okay, got um, it. Yeah, it's like the end of the FTX, and and then after that night where you where you pass, like it's like the you have to you know get qualified on all the battle drills during the week long FTX, and then the last thing you do is this this like twenty five or thirty miler uh, road march, and it's just savage, and you're just like you know you just kind of beat the crap from being out there. I went through in the summer, so oh, I mean, it was just super hot. I mean, anyone that's been at Benning knows um, how bad it is in the summertime, but. Um, I mean, I was like exhausted. It got to a point where I was like so exhausted in, in that road march where I was like, I had, I had to, I had to take a piss really bad, and I was just like, if I stop to take a piss, I'm not going to be able to get going again. So I just like I was I in my yeah. and, and, <laughs> and just pissed while I was walking. And when the drill sergeant like came up to me to pin on my cross rifles, he was like, he's like, what? You're still here? And I was just like, yeah, I was, I was still here, drill sergeant. He's like, you smell like piss. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, I, I pissed myself. <laughs> that is <laughs> he's great. Like, All right, Roger that. You know? <laughs> Uh, Very matter of factly, yeah. Okay, I understand hard. it. Been there, yeah. Got it. Moving out. All right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I was like, okay, well, that's what the infantry is like. That. So, but yeah, it was a uh, very challenging, but extremely rewarding. And um, you know, I mean, you, you definitely get tested. So enjoyed it. Why the hundred and first? What was it about the Screaming Eagles that said, "Hey, this is where I want to be"? You know, I. It's just 
it's one of those things about the infantry too. I mean, like when I when I talk to people now about you know wanting to join the military, like if I'm talking to some young civilian that's thinking about making that transition, and they talk to me about the good things and the bad things, like one of the good things is like the profound sense of history and like just the like the degree of respect and remembrance you know that people have, and it's like you know so. That for, for one, the unit was, like, legendary. You know, like, I was aware right. of their exploits. Like, I watched Band of Brothers, and I, you know, read uh, a significant amount of, of literature and, and everything else. It just seemed like a really impressive unit. And from an equipment perspective, I always knew that they got, you know, a lot of the, the good stuff, the new stuff first, um, like them in the 82nd. So I was like, you know, I mean, there was a part that was pragmatic. There was a, pre- uh, a part of it that was romantic. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's... You know, when I am processed into the 101st, it's like you go into your brigade or you go into your battalion, and it's like you'll you'll see like you know captured Nazi machine guns. You know what I mean? Like you'll see photographs mm-hmm. from you know uh, Hamburger Hill. You'll see you know what I mean? Like you'll right. see all this stuff, and, and it's just like it's great to be a part of a unit with such a long memory. You know what I mean? It's great to like Colin Powell used to be my old battalion commander. Like I like when you're pulling CQ or whatever, and you go in the battalion. And, uh, you know, you walk into that office where it shows, like, every battalion commander that, that the battalion's ever had going all the way back. And it's like, you know, Colin Powell used to be the battalion commander of First Strike. And it's like, I don't know, it's, it's just, it's, it means a lot to me to have earned a spot um, in a unit like that with such a long memory, if that makes sense. No, it certainly does. I mean, and, and again, there's a, you're not the only person who I talk to on this podcast who says, I wanted to go here because of this reason and that reason. There's a lot of connectivity between all these things and, and people who join up. So, I mean, it, it certainly is understandable. Yeah. Now, with that, you go into these situations with a preconceived notion and an expectation yeah. of how things are going to be. When you got yeah. there, were those expectations met or did they fall short? You know, um, I mean, I think that there's certainly parts of it that lived up to the expectations. I mean, um, and there, there were certain, certainly parts of it where, you get to see, um, like the human side of it, you know, and it's just like, there's, there was guys that I met that were like absolutely brilliant. There's, you know, guys that I met where I, I was just like, how could you even, you know, have gotten wavered, you know, into the military? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, it was, it was kind of a mixed bag, you know? I mean, I think that, you know, being a part of the unit itself and the standards, you know, like when I got there were extremely high, like my squad was, extremely competitive, um, extremely demanding, uh, had like a really good reputation within the battalion, um, for performance. Um, so, I mean, I was, I was proud to be where I was at. Um, and certainly like, uh, from like a personal perspective, like my squad and my platoon had a lot of OIF one combat vets, which was kind of relieving to me. Um, like I, you know, just because you, you, you think as like a new guy coming through, you're like, here are guys that have actually been there, done that, come home. You know, there's, there's people that you can really learn from. Um, so that made me feel good as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, from a difficulty of, of, of life perspective, I mean, you know, like the whole time you're in basic, they're like, wait till you get on the line. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you think mm-hmm. this is bad, wait till you get on the line. It's like, yeah, you got PT order. You, you know, I mean, the expectations are higher. The level of responsibility that you have is higher. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, and especially you know at that time that I joined, the uh, the army you know like they just transitioned over uh, to like the uh, what do they call it the PCT is the brigade combat team yeah the brigade combat team so yeah. you know yeah so they're like you know everyone's just kind of like learning how to do the whole war thing again it seemed like you know everyone's trying to find the best way to do things and you know make everything run as efficiently as possible so it was uh yeah I mean, Pretty pretty interesting time. Give me the date of when you get there. Like, what time frame are we talking about? Um, I want to say that there like June um, of '05. Okay. Um, and we ended up deploying in September. So, like, I got there and it was just like you know do the train up. Um, you know, I mean, just constantly going out to the range, constantly going out to the field, um, just nonstop work, basically. Were you excited I mean, about the prospect of getting there so quickly and then going and deploying? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I mean, I didn't like the the main driving factor of me joining was was going to war, you know. So, I mean, going going to war with the hundred and first, um, you know, actually going to participate, knowing that, and and it's it's another it's a huge luxury that you have, you know. I mean, I I 
I'll go around and I'll talk to soldiers now. And like, you know, back when I was in, you couldn't throw a rock, you know what I mean? And, and without hitting somebody that had a combat patch, you know what I mean? Right. And now it's like, they're, they're a lot more rare in the junior ranks. And, um, you know, everything that you do, you, you kind of have the luxury of knowing that it's for a purpose and it adds like a level of intensity or importance to every task, if that makes sense. Because like you are going, like if someone's doing like a little hip pocket training on language, you know, you're paying attention because, you know, you, you're, you're definitely going to need it. If someone's, you know, doing a range, you're like, I'm definitely going to use this. Like, it's like, there's no, like, you know that you're practicing for the big game, like the coach is going to put you in. So, um, I definitely liked being in the army when I was at war for sure. Yeah. Because it added that. And, level of importance. Let me give just some background for the listeners who aren't military. You know, the combat patch is kind of a big deal. It, it, everybody wears a patch on their left sleeve, denoting what unit they're in. On their right sleeve is the combat patch. And it got to a point where by like 2006, 2007, if you didn't have one, people looked at you cross-eyed because it's like, what have you been yeah. what have you been hiding for this long? You know, we started the war in 2001. We made it Iraq in 2003. Four years later, you're still not wearing a combat patch. And all of a sudden, people looking at you like, you're not up to standard or not up to snuff with everybody else. So yeah. when you get to a unit, you don't have one. Everyone looks at you as the FNG, and it's like, well, okay, this we need to break this kid in. Exactly, exactly. And it's 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 a uh, it's kind of like instantaneous credibility in a way. Um, and yeah, I mean, so when I joined, there was still like a significant. I, I would say probably about thirty percent of my platoon, which was high at that time, back in in uh, 05, Yeah, uh, had combat patches, um, and then. You know, after mine, after my deployment, OIF three, um, everybody, you know, I mean, pretty much everybody in the battalion. I mean, everybody had gone. So, I mean, you might have like maybe five percent or ten percent of like the replacements, you know, coming in to to fill in for guys that either got out or or whatever um, that that wouldn't have them. But you know, at, at that time, it's like you know that you're going down range. In, you know what, like eight months anyway. So it was just, I mean, now it's like a special thing. But like back then, it was like everybody, you know, everybody had one. All right, so you're going through the train-up right now to get ready to deploy. <clears throat> What's the environment in the unit like? Because this can be a really like good time for soldiers. You know, the, as, as much as hard work as it is, and you're out in the field for long hours and you're training, there, there, yeah. there's a lot of bonds that are built then, a lot of stories that you end up telling guys who end up, like you said, yeah. something like peeing himself in the field or, you know, crapping his pants or whatever yeah. it is. Stuff like that happens, and you just remember it for the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think that, you know, it was a, it was kind of an interesting train up just because it was a little bit mysterious. Like we didn't know what was going to happen, and then they're like, "Hey, you're going to this area called the Triangle of, De uh, of Death," and uh, that's always it's fun. like super bad. And, yeah, <laughs> and you're just kind of like, you know, I mean, it, it, it's just a weird deal. Just because, like, you know, I, I remember when I was in basic, and they're like, "Oh, the stairway to heaven," you know, it's like this crazy, like uphill, you know, like you're constantly on three points of contact, like you know, like rough march up this giant hill, and it sucks, and it breaks you off, and it's going to be so bad, and. You know, it's like everything gets harder. You know what I mean? Like as it fades into the rear view, basically. You know, and and it's just kind of like the time honored tradition of the military, where you know it was much harder when you did it, or you know, like the place is super bad and whatever. Everything gets exaggerated a little bit, but you know, there was that anticipation um, of like, hey, we're going to get into a, like a real like no BS fight. Um, but at the same time, like yeah, I mean, it was it was exciting. I mean, you know, being you know, young and, you know, down in a line unit and, you know, about to go to war and you know, you've got, you've got good friends and, um, you know, you you feel good about the squad that you're in. I mean, it was, it was a good time. You know, I mean, I, I made some really good friends, um, you know, developed some, some confidence. I mean, on the, on the flip side, I mean, I was like a little bit, I, 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 like, I imagine that it would be a little bit more, um, like I wish that there was more training. Like I wish that there was more you know, more emphasis on language. I wish that there was more emphasis on like individual weapons manipulation. Like I, w I wish that there was more, um, you know, emphasis on land nav and, and other, you know, kind of like your skill level one soldier tasks that are going to be kind of like the backbone of, of, you know, your ability to be successful uh, when in combat. Like, you know, there's, there's like a base level line that they've got to be able to draw to be like, Hey, you're qualified or not qualified, but, you know, and I get that, but at the same time, like, I feel like it was just kind of scratching the surface of what you are, like, after, you know, after I get back, you know, it's one of those things where I'm like, man, I, I can't believe that, um, and with the amount of learning that you actually do on the job yes. versus before the job, you're like, I can't believe I survived, if that makes sense, like, not knowing the stuff when I went over, so, um, yeah, I mean, there was that sneaky suspicion that I, I wasn't ready, if that makes sense, right. um, and then that got, that got validated pretty quick. 
Well, and for people listening, again, it, no matter how much we train, there really is no way to prepare for war until you actually get there. I mean, that's that's just yeah. – it, it's the nature of what it is. And you can get all the information and tips from people downrange who are there already, but nothing really prepares yeah, you until you get there. So there, yeah. there is a lot of OJT, as we call it, on-the-job training, uh, and, and, and you have to be able to adjust and be flexible and all those things. And sometimes that causes a lot of stress, not only you know at higher levels, but also down at lower levels because no one really prepares you sometimes for certain situations and certain – um, you know, I guess lifestyle yeah. changes that you have to go through. I mean, listen, we, we've all gone through the suck at some point if you've been through combat, but you, you know, there are things you'll always say, no one ever told me this. No one ever told yeah. me that, you know, the, uh, the conditions were going to be so austere, so austere that we, we really just weren't prepared mentally for what we were going to walk into. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and let me, let me mean, add I, one I, more I, thing real quick, just so for people listening again, you know, the triangle of death, um, you, you'll hear that term a lot. Uh, it is an it is an area of farmland that's about 30, 40 miles south of Baghdad, right on the Euphrates River, and it and it sits between a couple of different farmland areas. But cities that you may know, Matmedia, Yusufia, Iskandaria, all of them, they're all there. But it's all basically rural farmland. It just became a very um, hot spot and a hotbed for not only sectarian violence but attacks on Americans uh, on the roads there. And obviously, everybody who knows anything about Iraq, the the Roadside bombs were the, the, the weapon of choice for the enemy that they use on us the most. But with that being said, uh, let's kind of fast forward a little bit because you get to Iraq and you get boots on ground. What are you seeing? What are you thinking? What's going ha- What's going on right now? Well, so there's a, there's a couple of considerations. Um, you know, we get there. Um, it's extremely austere. I mean, we realize pretty quickly that, you know, logistically, um, we're kind of nowhere near where, where we thought we were going to be at. I mean, like there's like the, the base that we're staying at. I mean, not to disparage the unit before us. I mean, from, from what I understand that guard unit, you know, took a, uh, a pretty heavy amount of casualties and, you know, they didn't have a significant amount of support. Um, so I'm sure that they did the best that they could, but you know, it wasn't fortified. You know what I mean? Like the, like at least to a degree that, you know, like the big army was like, Hey, you know, like this is, this is, you know, to standard. Um, you know, and there's there's a wide variety of of, of kind of like uh, environments that we were fighting. I mean, there's there's densely urban areas, you know, with apartment buildings, houses, um, in Yusufia, uh, in Mamadia, or and uh, uh, Mulfayad, um, and then you had your kind of like more like um, lush riverine, you know, not quite jungle environments, but like yeah. I mean, I don't really know how to describe it, but it's it's kind of like your your farmlands, your rural, um, very lush, very green areas that were down near the Euphrates, um, you know, out in uh, kind of like the the edge of Yusufia. Then you had uh, right outside of uh, of Yusufia, you had Rush the Bula, um, which you know that was that was where we uh, we well, I mean, not just us, um, but Zarqawi was operating out of there. So like AQI. Um, you know, in Iraq, like, when it came down to, like, their actual footprint, like, the hardcore Mujahideen that, you know, knew how to make bombs, that were, you know, capable of training people, that had resources and logistical support, they were operating right on the outside edges uh, and then penetrating into, you know, our areas constantly um, and and attacking us. So, like, there was, like, um, we had a wide variety of enemies that that we were facing. We had a wide variety of environments that we had to learn to fight in. Um, and we had to do it from a very, very, very undermanned perspective. Um, I mean, and when I say that, I mean, um, I, I have, I've, I've personally been left at checkpoints by myself for eight hours. Uh, I've conducted ComSec changeover, driving distances of probably three to four kilometers uh, on my own in a Humvee. Um, I've done uh, routinely IED sweeps with uh, three, four people, tops, I mean, a specialist, and basically, like, you know, two privates and an ICOM uh, on foot, um, you know, routinely did patrols, you know, anywhere between five, six kilometers uh, into uh, really kind of red type areas, um, you know, with just three or four guys, uh, no air support, no medevac. Um, I mean, we just, yeah, I mean, it was, it was real rough. Um, I mean, the work the work never stopped. Uh, the pace was grinding. You know, like when you, like when we started off, it was a massive period of fortification, just trying to get everything built up. Um, and then we suffered a, a catastrophic, you know, uh, attack on our battalion level command element when they were when they were coming out to 
visit the JSB. Like we were supposed to be out there for like a week. I was a water treatment facility. Um, and then we were supposed to get out of there and be relieved, but we ended up being out there for like 33 days. It was like no electricity, no showers. You know what I mean? Like nothing. I mean, it was, right. it was, it was pretty bad. Um, but on their way out to see us, um, they ended up taking some contact. And then when they left, uh, the JSB, uh, they hit like a 500 pound IED. What's like, a JSB, IED. Justin? Oh, the JSB is the Chicken Safari Bridge. It was a okay. uh, kind of a platoon level patrol base or a platoon sized patrol base uh, that we used that basically secured um, the this bridge that was like the one crossing point uh, from the Euphrates, like that would go into Baghdad. Very so much like was, uh, was, very much like in Saving Private Ryan, that one bridge that they had to protect at the end. Yeah, very much. Yeah, like exactly. That. Yeah. Uh, we called it. We called that point the Alamo. The Alamo, exactly. Um, and it was yeah. So it was it was. You know, uh, that was a pretty rough area. Um, and, yeah, I mean, we were just, like, really, really undermanned. And so the, so the JSB uh, took a big hit, you said? Yeah, yeah, they took a, they took a big hit. Um, my best friend ended up getting killed, uh, Tyler McKenzie, uh, like, within the first, I think, 26 days. Um, you know, they lost, in the PSD, they lost one of their vehicles, and I think it was, like, three out of four passengers in the vehicle died. Um, and then after that, the battalion commander determined that we were going to own Route Sportster. And so we had a company size element, so, you know, 120, 130 guys. Um, and then, you know, from that, we had a platoon size patrol base when we started um, at the JSB and the Alamo. Um, and that was it. After that attack, uh, we had, I think, like four or five checkpoints that were squad size elements. Plus the platoon patrol base, plus the FOB, and then later on we ended up adding Rush Tabula, which is another platoon sized patrol base. Um, so we had two platoons that were constantly out. You know what I mean? Had a patrol base, and then we had all the checkpoints to man and the FOB. So I mean, you can you can start to see the math not adding yeah. up. All right, let me so, let me kind of let me let me just bring everybody into a couple of things that you said, just so everybody has some context here. Understand what, what we're talking about when you say you know you're doing. Um, patrols, you know, of five or six kilometers, which is close to a mile for those who don't do the uh, the metric, you know, conversion. Uh, basically, a kilometer a mile, about the same distance. Um, and you know, you're in a vehicle by yourself, going back and forth. These are things that you never train. You don't ever train that way, and that's why what you're alluding to is so tough because you'd never drive anywhere alone in Iraq. It just doesn't happen. It it, it goes against yeah, everything no. that we train on and everything that we expect. Uh, as far as security and things of those nature. So when somebody says do that and they don't really give you an option, you're sitting there as an individual going, okay, this is almost like a, a death warrant you're giving me here to just drive by yeah, myself. If something happens, even if I get a flat tire, I can't do anything. I have to walk by myself, and I'm the easiest target yeah. in the world for insurgents. So those are the kind of things that made the beginning of your deployment very, very um, tough and stressful because those things that happen daily, and again, you're talking about manning checkpoints basically are spots in the road where you guys were looking for insurgents and bad guys checking to see if they had roadside bombs, vehicle IEDs, things of that nature. And this is a job that you have to do like nonstop for eight to 10 hours, 12 hours a day. And it doesn't seem like it's physically that difficult, but it becomes mundane and more mentally it's hard to stay sharp because you're doing the same thing over and over again with this specter hanging over you that, oh my God, somebody could hit a button here and I could die. Well, when you're and and to go to put it farther, I mean, it's 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 a situation where it's like you know, yeah, if you had a, a full size squad um, manning a checkpoint, you know, you might be able to be running like a like a fifty fifty rest cycle. Um, but when you've got like you know six guys and and at least you know uh, five people up um, at a time, you know, like two on each side of the checkpoint plus one you know pulling guard, you know, from like an Overwatch position, um, like at the top of a building or something. I mean, you know, you've got one guy that's down. You know what I mean? So right. it's, it's like, it's, it's you know, an extreme level of fatigue. And, and, and you know, that was a kinetic area. I mean, at, like, it's, it's hard. I mean, everybody, and I, and I try to, it's, it's kind of hard to put into context. But, you know, I mean, like, we got attacked, like, every day. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it, was, it was like, there were days where you hit three IEDs in one day. You know, I mean... So it was like the, the stress was extremely high. Um, the probability, I mean, you were just talking to John. I mean, I vividly remember um, coming up. We were doing a, a resupply run for the checkpoint that uh, 
John was working at, uh, Checkpoint 5, and, uh, like, we came in, and uh, we wanted to give everyone a chance to eat, so we took over the guard position, so I was sitting in a, in a truck at TCP 5, and uh, John was the, the sergeant of the guard, um, so he was, you know, just kind of, like, on the rooftop, and um, we ended up having, like, a disturbance in the wire, and it's like, they, you know, someone had, had you know, run a V-bid into, like, I mean, they, I mean it, it's actually kind of a funny story, but they duct tape you know, somebody inside this vehicle. And so I'm like, I'm like watching like this vehicle that was like, you know, 10 vehicles back in the line to get through the checkpoint. And I see this dude like wiggling around and I'm like, what's going on? And then he hops out of the, uh, out of the vehicle and his hands are duct taped and his feet are duct taped. And he just like hops and he like looks at me and he like hops, hops, hops into the water. And I was like, what is like He jumped into the canal on the side of the road. And I was like, what in the world is going on? Wow. And, uh, John had made it down there and then kaboom, you know, the car goes. And, uh, so, I mean, it's like, like when you know that that's a possibility, you know, every single day, you know, it, it's it's mentally exhausting. I mean, it, like I say that, like that's how you described it, but it doesn't it doesn't give it the punch that it deserves. Like it's it is. Uh, well, here's the thing, and and anybody who's been in combat knows this. You get to a point where you realize you have to come to grips with your own mortality almost on a daily basis, depending oh, yeah. on, depending on what your job is. And that is, it's not even so much dying that scares you. It's the fear of dying that, yeah. that I mean, yeah. it's almost like you, you want to get it over with because yeah, the anticipation every worse. single day of thinking that this could be my last day can eat at you like nothing else. There is nothing that will kind of gut your soul than wondering when your last moment is going to be. And that every day is really what what causes breakdowns in individuals, and they can't handle it. And people who do handle it for yeah. a long period of time, God bless them. Uh, because if you if you can do that for a long period of time and come back and be normal, like be a functioning yeah. individual of society, you're much stronger than 99.9% of the people. Not everybody puts on a uniform as a tough guy. They're people too, yeah. and, and everybody has to deal with – with those kind of things that are just, they're not germane to what we live in in America. So that really is the hard part. And for you guys out there every single day, I guess my, my, my question next would be, with those conditions right from the bat, at what point in yeah. time did you start to notice changes in unit behavior, in leadership, <clears throat> in individuals, things of that nature? Were you picking up on any signs? I, I think that it was fairly early on. I mean, after... After the first casualties, um, and they had to set up those those checkpoints, um, I think that's when we lost the initiative. Um, and I think that you know, to anybody who's listening that doesn't know about infantry, I mean, like our job is to like close with and destroy the enemy. It's like we're always on the offense. I mean, you know, like, that's why the flag is backwards on our shoulder. <laughs> I mean, it's, because we're going forward, forward towards the enemy, right? right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's every every bit of doctrine, every bit of you know training that we've received is like you know, get up, get after it. And when you get tied down to static positions, um, and then you accrue casualties, um, and you can't, like, I'm going to give you an example. So we get the checkpoint, you know, like all the casualties happen with the attack on the battalion commander, right? Mm -hmm. Um, He orders us to set up the checkpoints. We set up the checkpoints um, based on kind of like proximity to each other, you know, um, and our ability to be able to like, you know, like, uh, quickly respond uh, and everything else, you know, like it was like, they're, they're staggered at like a, a, a fairly regular distance. Right. So, um, ultimately one of the checkpoints was like literally just on the side of the road. Like there was a house that was like next to the road that was empty. Right. Like we could have seized that house. Okay. Um, and it would have given the people that weren't constantly on guard, like a safe area to relax. Right. Like when they were off guard, Sure. um, they wouldn't let us take that. Right. And, Eventually, so it was like you were sleeping in a gutter, basically, surrounded by Constantino wire whenever you were, whenever you were off. So really, like, when you're talking about, like, austere, it's like you're living like a homeless person sleeping in a gutter, you know, like when you're out at checkpoint two. Well, um, probably, I think that was, like, the next casualties that we took. It was uh, Kastika and Nelson. Um, you know, we had asked for the house. They wouldn't give us the house. Like, battalion wouldn't let us take it. Um, and then... Sure enough, like a, a suicidal gunman came up with a pistol, basically tucked in the back of his waistband, and um, you know just came in, like got close enough, just you know drew his gun, and then shot up uh, the squad leader from uh, first squad and and the alpha team leader, and um, you know he was killed, obviously, like uh, the you know, the two forty gunner at the checkpoint uh, burned him down, but you know not before he had, he had killed the squad leader and the alpha team leader, and 
you know, when stuff like that happens and then you can, and then they're like, okay, we'll take over the house. Right. Oh God. Um, yeah. It's one of those deals where you're like, uh, and we were taking casualties like that all the time. You know, it was just like, you know, Hey, it would be better if we could do these IED sweeps in vehicles. Um, Hey, it would be better if we could do things this way. And they wouldn't let us do it. They wouldn't let us do it. Hey, we need more guys. They don't give it to us. And then it's like, you know, you, you get killed or, you know, like somebody, you know, gets seriously wounded or, you know, someone gets killed. And then all of a sudden, Oh, you know, here's, here's the house that you requested in the beginning. And I think that that like, there was like a, a catalyst. There was like an ember when, when people no longer felt like the battalion was supporting them. Right. And when it, when that lack of support was costing lives, I mean, I, I think that, I, I would feel comfortable speaking for members of the infantry in general when, when I say that, you know, we're comfortable with the idea of having to lay down our life for the mission. You know what I mean? Like, it's not something that, you know, we, we hold cheaply or anything, but we understand that the job that we chose, you know, is a dangerous one. But, you know, we don't expect that shift to be given up easily either. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And yeah. when when it seems that that ship is held cheaply uh, by the people in charge of you, um, it becomes kind of detrimental. And that's when these like little schisms of a different army start to form, you know, like these little smaller, that's where like the, 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 this little hive mind uh, tribal, you know, type uh, thinking takes place. So uh, I would say really immediately uh, after the first casualties that we suffered, so that would probably be when I started to notice the changes. All right. Well, I mean, let me caveat that simply by saying, in layman's terms, for anybody who is in the military who kind of puts their life on the line, the unqualified belief in the chain of command and the belief that there is someone always who has your back, even if they're not next to you, even if they aren't doing the same things you were doing, Knowing that there is leadership behind you, whether it's your company commander as a captain, whether it's battalion commander as a lieutenant colonel, whoever it may be, that they have your back and that they are doing everything they can to give you what you need to survive, that can keep you going. That that's called leadership. Like that that is what absolutely th- that, that is what is devoid of. And and you talk about the breakdown. The breakdown happened be- not because somebody wasn't physically there, because you can have a, an asshole physically there and it doesn't make anything any better. You know, I mean, it, yeah. it's it's the right person. That's- Echoing the right sentiment that gives you guys the want to to continue to do your jobs every day. Yeah, one of the big things that John uh, talks about and that I talk about in our talks is like the uh, influence versus control argument uh, in leadership, and you know, especially in today's army where um, you know our missions are going to be in spread out territory, like a platoon may be divided up into a fairly large sector. A company most certainly probably will. Um, you know, having like the ability to influence your soldiers um, and their behavior and have them invested into your, you know, into your value system and the institution's value system is necessary. You know, I mean, it's necessary. Like, like control, that's great. Like you you see a lot of leaders that subscribe to that mentality uh, in the military where it's like, you know, I can kind of be uh, an asshole all the time or, you know, like that super hard guy, but like they'll, they'll, you know, if they don't have, and control only works when I'm physically in front of you, and I right. can like make you do something. You know, like influence works when when you're out on your own. So it's 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 a massively massively important thing to have um, as a leader, just because you know that's the mission today. So let me ask you about the guys that you lost. Um, do you remember every yeah. single one of them? Yeah, of course. Yeah, like you could rattle off their um, names. Yeah, uh, Mackenzie was my roommate, my best friend. Um, and then he died with Munger um, and Smith um, in the IED uh, that, that uh, took out the battalion commander's PSD vehicle. Then it was Nelson and Kasika at checkpoint two. Uh, Britt and Lopez, uh, Lieutenant Britt was my PL, um, and Lopez was one of the replacements um, for Al- for first squad that had come in because uh, they had uh, lost their alpha team leader. Um, after that, um, there was a significant amount of, of wounded. Um, that happened in between there, but in terms of the KIA, um, it was uh, Tucker, Menchaca, and Babineau um, immediately after that. What was the hardest so, part about? Uh, I mean, did you go to the memorial services and things of that nature? Oh, uh, yeah. No, I mean, for Was that harder than you it, thought it was going to be? Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, you know, so... 
like when you talk about um, you know dealing with your own mortality and stuff like that. I mean, the truth of the matter is, um, we all make that bet. Like when we join up, I mean, specifically if you're in the infantry or if you're in combat arms. I mean, every soldier, I think, um, you know, every sailor, every every Air Force person, anyone who's in our military, when they join up, they understand that you know someone could ask you to pay that bill one day. You could be in a position where you know that ticket might get punched and. Like, we all have that understanding, but it's an academic understanding. You know, no matter no matter what, until you go through it, you know what I mean? Like, until you see it viscerally with your own eyes, you know, I mean, it, it's something that you only understand on an academic level. And, and even then, academically, the way that you understand it, you're like, oh, you know, if I get, if I get you know, clapped up and, um, you know, I'm laying there on the ground, I'm going to be able to tell, there's going to be dignity in it. I'm going to be able to tell somebody, like, you know, tell my wife I love her, or, you know what I mean? Like All the stuff you see in the movies. Really profound. Yeah, and the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of times there is no dignity to it. You know what I mean? Like, if you're not on um, a mission that you can articulate the importance of. You're, you know, like, you don't get to say anything. Um, and you think that, like, there's going to be people that come in to deal with that sort of thing. It's like you're for the infantry, and um, your job is to secure the objective, and you, know, you took casualties on the way there, and, you know, someone got hit by an IED, and it's graphic, and they're in pieces, and, um, you know, like, you just, found, you know, some teeth and lodged in a piece of a helmet, and, you know, the reality is is that there's no one that's coming to, like, deal with that. It's you. You know what I mean? You're going to be the one that gets the casualty bag. You're going to be the one that finds all the pieces. You're going to be the one that goes through all the sensitive items and, you know, tries to find his night vision goggles. Like, you're going to be the one, you know what I mean, who has to pack up his, you know, his personal effects, you know, and you're going to be the one that sleeps next to the empty bunk, you know, and it's 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 a hard thing. Um, no doubt, it's a really hard thing. And then you go you go through the reality of that, and then you go to the memorial service. And I remember the first time. I mean, I I, I cried the first one. Um, I cried, and you know, because I, I and I was also the EFR guy, so I was like the backup medic. I mean, at that time, it wasn't mandatory that everybody was like you know CLS qualified. It, for us, it was EFR. It was a Eagle first responder. It was like basically like our high speed trauma focused. CLS class. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like the backup medic, and, and I was like one of the only ones in the platoon. And uh, so I worked a lot of these casualties, um, you know, and, you know, you you go through the school, and it's like, you're going to be able to save somebody with this. Like, not, you know, like I forget what it was in Vietnam, it was like 75, 80% of the casualties or something like that came from, you know, uh, lack of abilities. Yeah, like exsanguination, basically. Yep. You know, and it's like, um, with stopping bleeding, you're able to save someone's life. Yeah, yeah exactly. stopping like, bleeding is the number one cause of death on the battlefield. I mean, yes, gun sh- it, it comes from a gunshot, but most of the times, you know, you can save somebody if you can stop the bleeding and get them fluids and get them IVs. And most of the times, that's yeah. really what ultimately ends up killing them is loss of blood. Yeah, and uh, and you know, time. Yes. So you know, it's it's. Uh, I remember the first casualties I rolled up on was you know Nelson, who was like one of the only guys that was nice. I mean, you know how it is in the infantry. It's like you show up and everybody hates you. Yep, you, know, everyone's, you know, trying to see what you're made of. And whatever. So it's like one of the only guys who was nice to me was Kazika, you know, and, and you know, Sergeant Nelson was like, I mean, he was like old. Um, but he was, and he was like hella mean, but he was like mean in that like adorable kind of like, you know, grandpa sort of way. You know what I mean? Like he's just like constantly, like none of his jokes were funny. You know what I mean? Like the way mm-hmm. he made fun of you didn't make any sense. Like he was just, he was a good guy. And, uh, that was hard, you know, to show up there and think you're going to be able to do something. And, uh, you know, I worked on those guys for probably 30 minutes and, you know, we were going to aerial medevac them and they denied our aerial medevac. Um, then it was like, okay, we're going to transport them in vehicles. And it's like, everything takes forever and it feels like you're moving so slow and everyone's yelling. And it's like, you know, deep down, you know, it's all for nothing. Cause like you, you can tell, like you've received the training and you know that you haven't been able to do anything. And then, you know, you get them back and they're dead, you know? And it's like, you couldn't do anything to save them. You know, I, 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 I worked on, I mean, between the Iraqi civilians and uh, the soldiers that got wounded, I mean, probably close to a hundred people that deployment. I don't, I don't know if I saved one, you know, you and guilt over that. It, yeah, I mean, I, I. It's understandable. I, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that you you could go through it, right? Because at the end of the day, you you can logic your way out of it all you want. Like I know I'm not like a like a vascular surgeon. I know I'm not. You know what I mean? Whatever. But it's like, I'm the guy. You know what I mean? Like right. I'm the guy 
that, uh, and, and I don't, I don't think that you could talk to a medic that, you know, doesn't take that personally. Like to some degree, I mean, I, I've, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't affect me like in a debilitating way. But yeah, I mean, like there are, there are times like, um, where you know I feel really bad about it, you know, mm-hmm. and it's just like, you know, I, I, I learned something. Um, I've done, you know, some private military contracting since then, and, you know, you meet some high-speed AT Delta who keeps you some trick, and, you know, it's just like, man, I wish I would have known that, you know? Sure. Um, but you didn't, you know what I mean? And, and it is what it is, so, um, you know, I mean, it's hard, man. No, there's no doubt, and listen, I mean, if it's any consolation, you know, the fact that you were able there just to be there um, speaks volumes, you know, because some guys just freeze up in general and, and they, they they can't do anything. And the fact that you were able to try as much as you can, even though you knew it was in vain and just do, doing what you were trained to do, uh, I, I think is a testament not only to you as an individual, but, you know, you know to what you learned as a soldier and what you, your, your dedication to your duty and your job, because that in and of itself uh, is something sometimes people get derelict in that soldiers in general get derelict in that they don't want to try they don't want to do it they, hey this isn't worth it and you know they kind of as you said logic it out in their own heads and and don't try so from that standpoint look yeah. you know it, there's it's not any it doesn't make you feel any better it doesn't make you sleep any easier at night but from you know one guy puts on a uniform to another you know thank you just for 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 doing what you were trained to do and and trying your ass off because um that is really all you can do certain times is do what you're trained to do and and yeah, you wish you were trained better, and maybe if you would have known X, Y, and Z, it might have made a difference, but you did the best of what you had at that moment, and sometimes that's all we can do as guys who put on a uniform. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it, and it's it's certainly something that, you know, I mean, you know, you do you do everything you can, and um, there's a lot that's not up to you, and that's a, it's just a, a hard thing to accept sometimes, yeah. but, you know, if there's not an aerial medevac, you know what I mean? Like, there's not an aerial medevac, and they're not going to get the treatment they need and the, and the skill of, of those doctors that are there at the cash, you know, in time. And that's just, that's, that's part war. of the deal. It's you know? what it is. I mean, yeah. There's, there's no, there's no yeah. it's, it's ugly and it doesn't sound great. And, and if you're the parent or you're the sister or the brother or a loved one of, of that individual, you hate hearing that. But again, yeah. it, it's part of what we sign up for. It, it, war is never pretty. It, it doesn't work out the way you plan. Yeah. Nothing you ever train for goes the way it's supposed to. No mission you ever plan out ever is executed exactly the way. And things happen and, and you have to go with what's in front of you at the moment. There's nothing else you can yeah. do. So with that, yep. all right, let me uh, let, let's kind of get to the, the the ugly part of of you know what happened uh, with your unit there uh, going forward. Yeah. So I don't with the breakdowns in the unit structure and the breakdowns in leadership and everything. I think you've painted a good picture as to why that happened, and it's almost like Lord of the Flies. If anybody's ever read that book, you, you kind of just have these little clicks, it's very and much little, like that, little facets of people who are doing what they want to do. And everybody is trying to survive, looking out for themselves. There is some sense of still doing what's best for the unit, but in reality, most people are just covering their own ass and moving forward and, and deciding to operate on their own about a lot of things. The guys who, who were involved in the whole thing, um, yeah. did you have any inkling that they were capable of anything like that ahead of time? Well, it's like the line kept on getting moved. Um, you know, and this is one of the things that I talk about. I mean, everybody... That's the big question, right? It's like everyone wants to know how it happened. That's what I've been talking about with Army leaders for the past six years. Um, and that's the big question. And, and I think that there's not a lot of people that want to invest what it takes to, to really understand how this stuff works. And these guys, like, the line, it, it all starts somewhere. And this is like the sergeant major, right, like with the boot. You know, like your boots mm-hmm. blouse or your your haircut or whatever, and you know, I know if there's sergeant majors listening, they're they're they're, they're sitting there like, yes, <laughs> yes, you know, tell them about the boots, you know. But but the reality is, is that when like the army is like this perfect entity, right? It's like this perfect ecosystem, like with perfect values, like it's virtuous, it's you know, it's brave, it's it's you know, it's uncompromising, you know. And then you introduce people into the mix, and people are fallible, right? And the thing that changes, like all these traditions, like the haircuts, the boots, all that stuff, it changes. It changes us to this institution. And I don't think a lot of soldiers, like, like they don't understand why. You know what I mean? Like, why is it important that I do this? And and the reason is, is because once 
you get on the ground and you get separated, like, you will be separated from your parent institution. Like, you can't reach out and touch the Army. Like, the Army is represented by leaders on the ground, you know, mm-hmm. all of whom are human beings that are fallible with their own strengths and weaknesses. And once somebody creates an environment where it's like, okay, I don't have to blast my boots anymore, or okay, like, I don't have to, um, you know, like, it's okay for you to punch a detainee if you're really mad. Like, if we just took a casualty, you can punch a detainee, right? Like, like these are all things that I think the vast majority, like, it's hot outside, right? You want to take off your shirt. You know what I mean? Like, like all of us have been there. Like, we've all done it. Like, has very little to do with combat effectiveness. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, we all can rationalize that. But the reality of the situation is, is like, once you cross that, that threshold, you're now not in the Army anymore. And people need to understand that. Like, people need to understand that, like, when it becomes okay for you to punch a detainee, you know what I mean? Like, you just opened up uh, kind of like a wormhole that you don't you don't know where that ends. You know what I mean? Like, you don't know how far that can go. But, like, now I'm in the Army where it's okay to punch a detainee. And somebody's going to take that. Like, it wasn't okay until it happened. And now that it happened, now everyone wonders where the boundaries are. You know what I mean? Like, no, is anyone going to have a conversation? And... and, 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 and Go ahead. No, I was going to say, the, the the wormhole you referenced, just think about, you know, it, it's a finger-sized hole. Then all of a sudden, you put two fingers in there. And then you get your whole fist yeah. in there. And then your whole arm goes through. And all of a sudden, yeah. th- th- there's just a natural, and sometimes it's faster than others, but an erosion of what used to be into something that is now totally different. Yeah, it is. And and it takes a couple things for it to get to where it got from us. I mean, I think that, um, you know, there was a belief um, that was, and, and there, like it was like a tribe. It evolved into a tribe. Like first platoon was fighting its own war. You know what I mean? And it had its own struggles that nobody else could possibly understand. And you know there were leaders that knew what was going on, and there, there was leaders who didn't know what was going on. And if you knew what was going on, and if you were a good leader, that was like fundamentally directly proportionate to like how little standards you enforced, basically. Um, right. And you know, uh, like it, it, it hurts me to say that, but it's like it. You know, everyone was tactically competent for the most part, but it was just more along the lines of, like, I mean, it, it just devolved into a tribe. And we were so spread out that, and everyone was so exhausted, I think, that, that people didn't do what was necessary in order to kind of rein everybody in. And it started with, you know, punching detainees or maybe, you know, busting up their, their trucks as they're going through the checkpoint if they were acting stupid or, you know, accidentally tried to, you know, go too fast or whatever. And then, you know, once that line got crossed, then it turned into, you know, other things. You know what I mean? And and eventually it got to a place where, you know, people were drinking and doing drugs routinely. I mean, that's something that, you know, John and I never did, but um, it's something that happened. You know, like we found out afterwards. We had no idea how widespread it was until afterwards. But, I mean, if you're asking me, like, did I suspect that it was possible? I mean, I suspected that it was possible for a bad shoot to take place, you know what I mean, like, and have somebody brush it off, but, I mean, what what we're talking about here is a staged home invasion, gang rape, and, you know, child murder, you know, like a murder of an entire family, and then burning somebody, presumably while they're still alive, you know, and that somebody is a 14-year-old girl. If you would have asked me if I had thought that the men in my platoon were, were capable of that, um, I would say probably not yeah well I, you know I just, I mean? nobody should be capable of that i mean that's 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 the the disturbing yeah. part of the whole thing you've been listening to the hazard ground podcast tune in next week for part two of this episode if you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com and if you like the show don't forget to subscribe rate and review on itunes Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.